Hi, Anthony. How are you? Good, Giselle. How are you? I'm good. So I'm Giselle Morales from Nightcast Media. I just wanted to say thank you so much for taking the time to sit with me during the Zoom. I understand you're incredibly busy, so I just want to say thank you so much for being here. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, so American Ninja Warrior, it's in its 13th season. I know it's already premiered. Um, this season has been full of changes, including you guys lowering the age limit to 15. I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about how you guys came to that decision. Sure. Um, you know, a lot of it stemmed from the success of American Ninja Warrior Jr. Um, we, the oldest age group on American Ninja Warrior Jr. is 13 and 14 year olds. And a couple summers ago, we saw just absolutely remarkable performances by those kids. And, and it was clear by the way they performed on that course that, that they were nearly ready for the big course. Um, we also, the majority of them are trained by by our elite ninjas who we know well. And so we were able to get a lot of intel on just how strong they were, just how they could be expected to perform on larger scale obstacles. Um, and they also travel around the country and they perform in, they compete in local competitions in organizations that we're familiar with. And so we have a sense of how they, how they were doing in those competitions and they were dominating leaderboards. And, and we, and our previous age minimum had been 19 and so, under that guideline, they would have sat on the sidelines from the ages of 15 through 18. Um, and it didn't, we couldn't really f explain, we couldn't really justify that. It didn't make any sense to us. It wasn't logical for them to sit on the sidelines. You know, we looked at Olympic sports like gymnastics and swimming where some of the best athletes are 13, 14 to 18 years old. And, and we, and it's, and it's, incredible to watch you know we we all tune into the olympics every four years and we're blown away by these teenage athletes and seeing how they can compete against adults and so we thought um, it was worth a shot to bring in a select few to see how they did um, as sort of a test run um, to see these elite athletes compete against um, our elite ninjas and uh, and they have far exceeded our expectations uh, if you've seen the first few episodes, you know that they are not only capable, they're, they're excelling, they're dominating the leaderboards. Um, both the, the boys and the girls are proving that, that it was a good decision, that they're ready. And, uh, and we, we, we just finished shooting season three of American Ninja Warrior Jr. and it's going to start airing on Peacock in September. And so now we know what the next batch of teenagers looks like because the 13 and 14 year olds on that show um, just showed us what they could do. And it has us really excited for next season when we can bring in the next group of 15 year olds. Yeah, I think that's incredible. And I can only imagine, you know, the kind of stories that you know, American Ninja Warrior gets to tell with a younger group of athletes. And I know when viewers tune into the show, obviously they want to see these contestants, you know, run across this obstacle course as fast as they can do their very best. But another huge part of the show is a storytelling component and hearing the stories of these contestants. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of that storytelling aspect of the show? Sure. You know, I, I a minute ago, I talked about the Olympics and, uh, and, and that is sort of a marker for us. And, and it always has been, you know, we, we've always strived to tell Olympic type stories on our show. Um, you know, with Olympic athletes, the audience has no familiarity with these people whatsoever. They're not following track and field in between Olympics. They're not following swimming. They're certainly not following shot put um, or um, luge or curling. These are people they're entirely unfamiliar with. And, and the broadcaster gets 30 seconds to a minute to somehow get you invested in these people. And and that's the same thing with American Ninja Warrior. You know, these are not professional athletes. You don't know anything about them. Um, they're, they're everyday people like you and I. You know, they're shopkeepers, they're doctors, they're lawyers, they're blue collar workers, um, they're teachers. And, and for you to care as a viewer, you need to know a little bit about who they are. And so we think it's critical that um, before each run or the majority of our runs, we give the audience just a little bit of insight into who they are and why we chose to let them um, compete on our show and run our course and, and why we think they have a story worth sharing. And so we, we put a lot of energy into finding those people, casting them, um, 
allowing them to tell their story in their own words. That's a big part of what we do is we don't put words in their mouths. We, we tell the story not from narration, but through a first person narrator. And, and so they get to tell their story in their words. And we, we allow them to share with our audience what inspired them to try this seemingly impossible task and to take on this challenge that the majority of us um, would not have um, the, the ability to do. Yeah, I think some of the stories that you guys tell are, are so inspiring. And, you know, it really shows the dedication that these athletes put into getting themselves ready in the hardcore training that they go through to prepare themselves for American Ninja Warrior. And I know another change you guys implement in this season is allowing contestants to choose between different obstacles. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit more about that new twist and how that might add a little bit of complexity or difficulty for the contestants? Yeah, we every off season we try to think of ways to to refresh the course, and and we always add new obstacles. There's there's always dozens of new obstacles every year, um, and this and for a few years we've been trying to figure out a way to create some sort of an either or on the course where the ninjas got to make a choice. Um, we played with a, with dozens of ideas, and we finally landed on one that that we really loved, and when we call it split decision. Um, Traditionally, the balance obstacle has been um, the sticking point for even the elite ninjas. They all, they all fear the balance obstacles. They're, they're nearly impossible to train for and, uh, and anything could happen. And so we thought it would be fascinating to see what would happen if they were given a choice between two balance obstacles. Because they always get to that balance obstacle and there's a moment where they gather and they catch their breath and they stare it down. Um, but there's still, it's still just a physical endeavor. And we thought how interesting it would be if we added a mental component to it as well. So now you get to this place, this fearful moment, and not only do you have to gear up physically to do this, but you have to make a choice mentally. Um, and so we did our best to, to pair up two balance obstacles in every round um, that were equally difficult and to present them with an option. Do you prefer this one on the left that may um, cause you to take more steps or this one on the right where you may need to trust your strides a little bit more. And what, what's also interesting is that many of the returning balance obstacles that some of these athletes may have fallen on before. So then you get to choose, do I want to um, face my demons and conquer this thing that took me out in the past so I can now put that behind me for the rest of my life and check that box? Or do I want to go the other direction and not even look at this thing that's been haunting my dreams ever since I fell on it? So, and we've seen both approaches. Um, and as, as the season goes on and, and as we get into our semifinal episodes, um, there's a new split decision and it happens much later on the course near the end in position nine, which is the next to last obstacle. And this time it's an upper body obstacle, which has traditionally been in that position or an incredibly hard balance obstacle. So a lot of people get to that ninth spot and they have already conquered eight obstacles and they're taxed, they have nothing left and they know because of what's left in their grip or their forearms that there's no way they're gonna get through that ninth obstacle. They give it everything they got, but they kind of know before they even start that they're gonna fall. Now, when they get there, if they have that feeling, they have this option of going to the right and trying this balance obstacle. Though, although it may have taken out 75% of the people that tried it the last time we had it on a course, that means that somebody could get through it and maybe that's me. And so they get to make that decision. And, and on top of that, with the power tower looming and the power tower gives you the opportunity to compete for a safety pass, which gives you a do over in the national finals. Um, the balance obstacle is faster. You just run across it. You don't have to work your way across this very difficult upper body obstacle. So if you're going for time, you may want to try the balance obstacle and get to that uh, the, top, the top of the 10th obstacle faster and give yourself a shot at the power tower and the safety pass. So a lot of really fascinating choices to be made on the course this year. Yeah, I think the obstacles are incredible and I can only imagine the sort of psychological aspect as you're going through the course, thinking of which, which side should I go. Um, and I know as the shows progress, you guys are in your 13th season and you guys have continued to grow immensely over the years. Can you talk about how you've seen the fan base and the sport of Ninja Warrior itself grow? Yeah, it really has grown year after year. And, and a lot of that is because Ninja Warrior is the kind of thing that you can do yourself. And so as the show has grown, so have the amount of ninja gyms in cities across the country. Um, there were zero when we started. And the only place that you could run up a warped wall was in an empty swimming pool. 
And the only place that you could train anything like a ninja obstacle was at the local playground and, you know, do the, do the monkey bars with your kids. Um, you know, people were jerry rigging uh, ninja obstacles in their backyards um, and trying to train on, you know, these uh, ramshackle salmon ladders. Um, but one by one, these ninja gyms started to pop up around the country. Um, some of them were, you know, in sort of expansive backyards, but some of them were in actual facilities. And, and the success of those gyms and the proliferation of those gyms has allowed people to train Ninja Warrior. And, and when, you, when you train it, you want to watch it. You know, you want to see what the elite athletes can do. And you start to wonder, can I do that too? And, and you work towards a goal. And as interest in fitness in this country has also grown in the last 13 years, so has the Ninja Warrior fitness craze. And so the ability to, to try something that not only is going to get you healthy, but is going to be fun in the process is appealing to people. And, and, it, and they're very tangible goals. So, you know, you can, you can walk into a gym and look at a salmon ladder and say, I'd like to be able to do that. And the first time you try it, it you can't, you're just not ready. But you can set a goal and say, within six months, I want to be able to get up three rungs of this salmon ladder or I want to be able to work my way across half this pegboard or whatever it is. And, and there's someone there to teach you how to do it. And, and they, they probably had the same goal as you a few years ago, and they somehow got to that point. And so I think a lot of people have found that as opposed to just running on a treadmill, um, you know, or doing jumping jacks in the basement, that this is something you can do that's really fun. You can bring the kids to the gym, you can do it together. And, and it, it is difficult to find time to train when you have a family. And now it's something that you can do together. So all of these aspects have led to the growth of the show. And, uh, you know, unlike a lot of other physical competition shows, you know, you're not going to, there's no holy moly course for you to go play on. There's, there's no giant cannonball for you to slide into, but there, there are ninja gyms that you can go play on and, and test yourself against um, some of the best. Yeah. I think that's awesome to see how the show has grown. Um, I know getting started, it can be super difficult to get a show that really sticks with viewers. And I know there's some new obstacles. You touched on a couple of them. I know the warped wall is one uh, fan favorite. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about the process behind sort of creating those obstacles. How do you, how does that, how long do they usually take to complete? If you could talk about the production of those a little bit. Yeah, we, it, Ninja Warrior has become a, a, a year, all year endeavor. You know, there used to be a bit of an off season, you know, where we would finish production and then there were a few months until we started up again. But because we're, um, we're so focused on creating new obstacles year round now. We, we're really thinking about it all season. So as soon as the season ends, we immediately start um, sketching up new ideas. Um, we have an obstacle design challenge where we accept submissions from our viewers and we get a lot of ideas from that. Um, and, you know, I, as part of the team that helps develop these, I know that I'm just always, wherever I go, I'm looking for ideas. So if I'm at the park with my kids, or I'm looking at YouTube videos or, or watching sports on TV, everything is sparking an idea. Um, so I would say in October, uh, September, October is when we start to kick around ideas in conversation. Um, by late October, we, uh, uh, as a team, we start to put stuff on paper um, and we start to narrow down our, our vision a little bit. And by December, so November is spent, a lot of November is spent um, building prototypes. Um, we, we build sort of smaller scale versions of what we think might develop into an obstacle or a component of an obstacle. And we spend most of December and a lot of January testing. So we bring in uh, testers of all different shapes and sizes and ages and genders uh, into a warehouse basically. And, and we test all sorts of different um, components that may develop into obstacles. And, and over those couple of months, things start to take shape. And we start to look at a grid of what may become an obstacle and how we may pair it with previous obstacles and what city it may go into. And so by January and February, we're testing full scale obstacles and, and really sort of setting our courses for the season. And, and those are locked by the middle to late February. Um, and even then, we've got to start thinking about what are the Vegas obstacles going to look like? What, are we going to do a skills competition? So it, it's really never ending. Uh, and, uh, and we're just constantly uh, racking our brains of ways to challenge our ninjas in new ways. Yeah, that's awesome. And I know you, at the beginning of the, 
of the interview, you talked a little, about, a little bit about the Olympics and how that was kind of the drawing board for you guys creating the show and in terms of storytelling and wanting uh, viewers to sort of relate and connect with the contestants. I was wondering if you could talk about sort of that full circle moment. You know, I know this season you guys had two former Olympians. You've had other professional athletes. I know Andrew East was recently on the show too. I was yeah. wondering if you could talk about that sort of full cir circle moment of having these former Olympians come on American Ninja Warrior to test themselves. Yeah, we, we've we always had Olympians. I, and I did a little research before um, this call because I knew you wanted to talk about that. And as far back as, um, season eight there was our there had already been 23 olympians on the show and that was five years ago so that means there have been probably 50 olympians that have competed on our show um they're not all big names um but they come from winter sports and summer sports and and, and every imaginable sport we've had uh, luge athletes and skeleton and track and field um gymnastics pole vault Um, and so I think Ninja Warrior is, is, is a natural progression for an Olympic athlete, you know, particularly the ones that are no longer competing. They're, they're so competitive. Um, and it's very hard to walk away from competition when, when you've spent your entire life um, in that milieu. And so Ninja Warrior is another place where you can go. You can go to the gym and you can continue to test yourself and push yourself and compete. And then you can come on our show and, and see if all of the skills that you developed in your sport translate to our sport. Um, and, and a lot of times they do, particularly with the gymnasts. Um, they're just so, their body awareness, their spatial awareness, their ability to contort themselves and use their upper body strength is remarkable. Um, this year has been different actually because not only have we had Olympic athletes competing, we've had really high profile Olympic athletes cheering on a lot of our athletes. Um, it's an Olympic year and with the Olympics on NBC, um, there's been this really terrific crossover. And so we've had so many remarkable athletes from Scott Hamilton to Christy Yamaguchi to Summer Sanders to Brandy Chastain and, and all, all of these really famous athletes, Bonnie Blair, you know, multi gold medal Olympics, Olympians, um, watching our athletes and cheering them on. And they're so invested. It's incredible to watch, you know, they know what it takes. To succeed they know the level of effort and training and dedication and passion that it takes and so they they're as invested as they would be in watching an olympic athlete because they know how hard our athletes have worked to get to this point and and so it's it's really uh fulfilling to watch these high profile athletes uh give so much support and so much energy and, and so much um enthusiasm towards our athletes um, it really has come full circle. And, you know, we're such big Olympic fans as producers that to get these athletes into our world cheering for our athletes has been very fulfilling. Yeah, and I also, I think I read somewhere that uh, former contestant, I believe Josh Levin also uh, competed to try out for the Olympics. So I think that's awesome that it's just uh, American Ninja Warrior contestants and Olympians are kind of like crossing paths in that sense. So I think that's really yeah. awesome. And uh, Megan Martin, who's one of our most um, successful Ninja Warrior athletes is a commentator this year at the rock climbing in the Olympics. So it really is um, a nice blend. And, and for years, people have been asking us, when is Ninja Warrior going to become an Olympic sport? And there is a movement to have it become. It's a very long process and, and there are many steps involved. But someday, I, I do think you'll see Ninja Warrior as an Olympic sport. Yeah, I also read that too. And I was going to bring that up. Uh, Ninja Warrior, I think that would be awesome to have in the Olympics. I think it. it really tests sort of every bit of athleticism. So I think like some one day it's going to get there for sure. I we hope so. Um, as far as like the future for Ninja Warrior, can you talk about like any like additional like plans you guys have or what you hope for the future of Ninja Warrior? Yeah, I mean, we, we're still in the middle of season 13. And so we haven't done a lot of planning yet for season 14. Um, but I do think you could expect to see um, more teenagers. I, I, it's been a really successful experiment. And so um, I think that we'll see on Peacock this year on Ninja Warrior Junior, we'll see these 14 year olds um, perform. And those are the kids that we'll be seeing the next year on the big show. Um, I, we're always adding new obstacles. I think split decision has also been a rousing success. So um, we'll probably think of more ways to challenge them mentally. Um, 
and, and just more stories to tell. You know, we're always, there's so many people out there with so many great backgrounds and stories to tell that, you know, we're, all, we're always digging them up and looking for new, um, new people to share. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about casting because I know, you know, you guys are 13 seasons in and, you know, with social media, the rise of social media, I'm sure that also plays a factor judging from the beginning of the show to where social media was kind of on the rise to now where it's this dominant presence. Can you talk about like how that sort of shifted you guys' casting a little bit? Yeah, well, what social media does um, for us as producers is it, is it gives us a little, um, a little more insight into the athletes, you know. The, the application process is, is essentially that everybody submits a three minute tape. And so in those three minutes, we ask you to, to share with us um, some video of you on some obstacles. So we have a sense of how you might perform um, and to talk to us on camera about who you are and, and why you think you're worthy of competing on the show. And so um, it can be challenging in three minutes to get all that across. And, but, but social media allows us to do a, dig a little bit deeper. And, and maybe see a little bit more of who they are. You know, it allows people to share um, more of themselves. And so if, if, we're fast, if we're interested in an athlete or we're deliberating about a couple athletes, we may go to their social media and see, um, you know, what kind of stories are they sharing with their, um, with their followers? What kind of pictures are they posting? Who are they beyond the tape that we saw? Um, and they also may post more videos that we get a chance to look at. So it does open it up a little bit and gives us more of an opportunity to, to un understand who they are as people. Right. And my final question for you is sort of circling back to the very beginning. I understand the show originally started on a smaller network called G4. Yeah. And looking back now, did you ever imagine that the show would sort of take on the life that it has? No, I don't think anybody did. Um, yeah, it was a, a much smaller show with a much smaller intended audience. Um, but that's the magic of Ninja. Uh, it, it somehow it just pulls people in. And, uh, you know, it, I think that it, it originally people expected that it would be um, a program for young males. And that's why it was placed on, on a network like G4, which primarily had a young male audience. But the truth is that this show is cross-generational and, and it's really one of the rare shows um, that inspires co-viewing. And so once we realized the power of the storytelling, that it wasn't about what they were doing on the course, it was about who they are as people and what they had overcome just to get to the course. And what they did on the course was the cherry on top. Once we figured out that it was, it was about sharing these remarkable stories from people that are just like our audience, that opened up the, the show to, to an entirely new perspective. And so when we leaned into the storytelling and we, we adjusted the casting to find a broader base of, of competitors, um, it changed everything. And so, no, I don't think we ever expected it would grow to this point. Um, once we started to get a sense of the broad appeal, you know, and we dove into that aspect of it, we started to see the exponential growth and, and we've been thrilled to see it continue to grow. But no, I don't think at the beginning we ever would have had any idea. Yeah, and I love hearing stories about how shows kind of get going and then they just kind of kick off and become this huge phenomenon. I think that's amazing to see where American Ninja Warrior started and where it is now to become the sort of fandom that it is. It's, it's huge. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. Sure. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. And before we go, I just wanted to say, give you, give you the opportunity to sort of share with us, you know, what, what else you guys have coming up, or if you wanted to talk about American Ninja Warrior um, when it airs so that viewers can make sure they tune in. Sure. Yeah, we're on Monday nights um, at 8 p.m. And uh, we, we, there are a couple of preemptions because of the Olympics, so I'm not gonna give you exact dates because we're off for two weeks for the Olympics and then we're back on. But look for us every Monday night at eight o'clock. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, we're on all the way through the summer and through until mid-September. Awesome. Thank you again so much. I really appreciate the time. Great, thank you, Giselle. Appreciate your time.